Welcome back to The Slash, and in today's video, I'm finally giving you what so many of you have asked for ever since Who Killed Who became a thing. Today I'm looking at Scream Resurrection, the third season of MTV Scream, released in 2019. Scream Resurrection follows Dion Elliott, a running back for his high school football team, the Weaver Reapers, that is located in the slums of Atlanta, Georgia. Him and his group of friends he met in detention become the target of Ghostface, who plans to expose them all for who they really are and maybe get a few kills in while doing it. Scream Resurrection is the first season of MTV Scream to ignore the continuity of the first two seasons. Viewership of season two was the lowest it has ever been due to season one's mixed critic reviews, which unfortunately meant that there wasn't much interest in bringing the series back and was therefore cancelled after two seasons. There was also a ton of creative differences between MTV and Netflix, which also led to the show's eventual cancellation. It laid dormant for two years until VH1 picked the series back up for another season in 2018, and originally had plans to bring the original cast back, but couldn't for reasons I'm not really sure about. Because of this, they decided to reboot the series into its own little six-episode miniseries with an entirely new cast, setting, and killer, which finally found its home on VH1 in July of 2019, and was eventually put on Netflix along with the show's other two seasons. Despite Resurrection being the first season of the show to feature the original Ghostface costume and returning voice actor Roger L. Jackson, a lot of people were unhappy with the outcome of the season, mainly due to the fact that the Lakewood cast didn't return. It also received tons of backlash for its writing, shortened down episode count, and the poorly developed characters. Honestly though, despite all this and more, I still find myself really Really enjoying Scream Resurrection. I was a diehard fan of the Lakewood storyline when I first came across the TV series in 2018, so I of all people should be disappointed the original cast didn't return. While I still very much am, I still really appreciate Resurrection for being something different and succeeding in it most of the time. It's got a great setting and some really crisp cinematography, a much darker and more adult tone compared to the first two seasons more teen-oriented tone, some solid chase scenes, and really interesting performances for most of the characters, despite the criticism that they were written very flatly, which is a criticism I actually disagree with. Also, because of its darker and more adult tone, Resurrection features some of Scream's most brutal and creative kills to date. Ghostface is still swinging the knife from time to time, of course, but environmental weapon usage is much more prominent in an attempt to make Ghostface a more resourceful killer in this one. He's using fire, syringes, cars, plastic bags, hell, even a trash pecker. There's also a relative increase in gore once again, and even though most of the season's effects are CG, they still look pretty damn good most of the time. Most of the time. I know a lot of people hate Resurrection, and while I agree it's far from perfect, I still can't help but enjoy and appreciate it. To kick off this episode of Who Killed Who, we need to first talk about our two killers this time around, Jay Elliott and Beth Thompson. The internet says her last name is Thompson, but in the credit she doesn't have a last name, so I'm not really sure. Anyway, Jay is played by Tyga and is Dion's half-brother, whose motive for targeting him was revenge for letting Marcus die and always treating him like a stranger while they were growing up together. By the way, if you actually watched this season, you'd understand why I'm using Marcus and Dion interchangeably when I talk about him dying. It might be confused, but you'll get used to it, I promise. Our other killer, Beth, is played by Georgia Wiggum, who starred as Kat in season 1 of 13 Reasons Why, and is set to star as Blair Bennett in the upcoming TED TV series. Cool. Her motive for targeting Dion is a simple one. She wants to expose the gang for who they really are on the inside, and she just likes killing. Not much more to it than that. A lot of people think that they're weak motives, but honestly, I think they're fine. They're not too deep and not that hard to understand, so I'll take it. Together, Beth and Jay scored 11 kills throughout their six-episode killing spree, and for those of you who were looking for personal theories rather than confirmed lore, I hate to tell you this, but most of these kills have already been debunked by the two killers. I'll still talk about them, of course, but we really only have two kills that we need to figure out ourselves. But first, I'll talk about the kills we can determine through process of elimination. Like I said, Scream Resurrection had 11 kills this time around, which consists of Dion Elliott, Tommy Jenkins, Avery Collins, Latavius, Shane, Luther, Manny, Amir, Officer Westbrook, and of course, the two killers themselves. Based on this list, we can determine who killed nine of the victims through process of elimination, and that's Dion Elliott, Tommy Jenkins, Avery Collins, Shane, last name, Luther Thompson, Manny, Amir, and the two killers themselves. Without any further ado, let's get into the who killed who, starting with Dion Elliott. Season 3 begins with the death of Dion Elliott, but before that, we've got to get our typical Scream opening scene of having the most recognizable character in the opening scene. Paris Jackson plays Becky, who is preparing some sort of salad when she receives a call from who she believes is a telemarketer trying to promote his online sex business. The call quickly turns dark, with the telemarketer asking the common ghost face one-liner, if you know, you know, before she abruptly hangs up. She continues slicing into a tomato, but the doorbell ringing startles her and causes her to cut herself. She brushes it off and prepares her costume before 
answering the door to be greeted by Ghostface, who was just standing there staring at her. In an homage to Tatum's death in the original Scream, Becky asks the voiceless killer a sarcastic question, which Ghostface answers by just nodding. He then pulls out a knife and stabs Becky in the chest, but wait. Where's the blood? Oh, right, it's Halloween. Yeah, this knife is major fake sauce, and it's not a real ghost face either. Becky gives him candy and tells him to beat it, and he runs off right into the night. On the kid's way through an abandoned scrapyard, he runs into Tommy Jenkins, a bully who takes his candy and insults his costume. Man, way to add insult to injury, you little prick. Anyway, the kid in the ghost face costume was none other than Marcus Elliott, and his twin brother Dion shows up, dressed up as a football player. Dion motivates Marcus to go confront Tommy, so Marcus hops a fence into an abandoned scrapyard and goes looking for him. This place is not abandoned at all, though, and the man living there is... Candyman? Yeah, Tony Todd, the guy who played the hook-handed killer, is playing another hook-handed killer, this time named Hookman. Go fucking figure. Anyway, Hookman gets pissed off that he wasn't casted in the Candyman reboot, and takes off his anger on Marcus, who thrusts his hook through his head, killing him instantly. This is the first scream to kill an actual preteen child, and it's done in a surprisingly dark way. It's also the first scream opening scene kill to not be done by Ghostface at all. We can cross those two things off the list, and now that we know who killed Dion, let's get to the actual Ghostface kills, starting with Tommy Jenkins. Tommy Jenkins, now 18 years old and played by Nash Greer, is now an Uber driver. He drives to what looks like an abandoned homeless shelter to pick up someone named Marcus, who asks for assistance to the car because he's in a wheelchair. Tommy gets out of the car and approaches the doorway, but gets spooked by the darkness and runs back to the car. He texts Marcus to tell him, nah, this ain't it, B, and looks behind him to reverse, but Ghostface is there, and he quickly stabs him in the neck and puts a plastic bag over his head that fills up with his own blood. Man, I guess TJ became one with the deleted. Good kill, though. The plastic bag was a nice touch. Tommy Jenkins is revealed to have been killed by Jay, as he reveals during his reveal and is shown in a flashback. The reason he killed Tommy is more personal than outright revenge-worthy. It's mainly because Tommy tormented his half-brother and bullied him any chance he got, and technically drove him to his death. The kill was more of a personal hitman mission than a random kill, but hey, it's a good kill nonetheless. Avery Collins, the quarterback for the Reapers and Dion's teammate turned rival, meets a pretty grisly fate when he calls Beth during the silent disco and messes with her, disguising his voice with... Disguising his voice with... Fucking kidding. Disguising his voice with his own voice and threatening her. Beth immediately figures out who he is and begins grilling him while he looks down on her from above. As she does, Ghostface comes up from behind Avery and pushes him off the ledge and impales him through what I assume is a huge Halloween decoration. I don't really know. But it has blood and gore and all, so that's pretty cool. Another great kill for the books and another asshole character who deserved the necessary roughness. Like TJ, Avery was also killed by Jay. We know this for a few reasons that make it very obvious. One is because it literally couldn't have been Beth because she was talking to him on the phone as he died, and the other is because it's also revealed in a flashback in the end during Jay's reveal. I'm pretty sure Beth probably would have wanted to be the one to kill him though, since he's also the kind of asshole who pumps and dumps, as revealed by Beth during the phone call. Still though, good work Jay. This kill goes hard. Shane, who doesn't have a last name for some reason, a lot of the characters in this season don't have a last name, is a dropout drug dealer played by frequent horror actor Tyler Posey, who once had a thing with Beth, so that should be a pretty obvious hint right there. Shane gets high on death when he goes out into an alleyway to investigate some people throwing eggs at his window because it's Devil's Night, that's a thing in Georgia. He gets a call from his favorite buyer, Ghostface, who tells him the only drugs he wants are running through his veins. Shane gets freaked out and pulls out his gun, and when he walks away, a conveniently placed ladder falls on him and pins him to the ground. Ghostface climbs down the ladder and pulls out a syringe, which he slowly and torturously sinks into Shane's eye, which causes him to overdose and die. I guess it took more than silver bullets to take this Teen Wolf down. This kill was the first kill to finally be done by Beth, as revealed in a flashback during her monologue at the end. The reason she killed him is because he began to suspect her during his confrontation, and wanted to make sure he didn't find out. They also used to hook up, and Beth probably felt very taken advantage of, so she took him out. I'm honestly not really sure of the entire reason why she killed him, but hey, we got another great kill, so I'll take it. Coming just halfway down the list, our next kill is actually the one who killed real Dion in the beginning, Luther Thompson. Luther's heart-crushing death happens when he is confronted by fake Dion, Liv, and Amir to figure out the truth about his brother's death and if he's even really dead. Luther assures Dion that he's dead by showing him the place where he buried his brother after discovering his body in the trunk of a car, which also reveals that Hookman didn't actually kill- Okay, you know what? This name shit is too complicated. I'm just gonna call dead Dion Marcus, okay? It makes sense, I promise. Anyways, after getting the answers they need, they leave. Just as they're leaving, they hear Hookman scream and they find him with a stab wound in his stomach, which was done by... Oh, you thought I was going to tell you who killed him before we even get to his kill? Haha, <laughs> nope. We still got a while to go. 
bruh. Luther runs into Ghostface again, and they start dueling. Uh, what the fuck? Yeah, man, it sounds badass in retrospect, but this is probably one of the worst moments in the season, IMO. It just does not feel as badass as it's meant to be, and it feels very out of place for Ghostface. We admittedly do technically get a face-off between Ghostface and Candyman, but it's cut pretty short when Ghostface overpowers Luther and locks him inside of a car compactor. Dion tries to stop it, but it's too late. Luther apologizes for what happened to his brother and gets crushed to death by a car compactor with a huge spill of blood. Before the Who Killed Who monologue, I actually thought this kill was done by Beth, because she was with Kim and Manny not too far from the scrapyard, but no, it was done by Jay. As I keep repeating, he admitted it during his monologue, and it just makes the most sense. He believed that Luther killed his brothers, so he gave him a killing right back. Manny, who also doesn't have a last name, is Kim's gay best friend played by Julian Yao Gioiello, I think I pronounced that right. He gets without a doubt the most mean-spirited death in probably the entire franchise when you remember that he has asthma. After fighting with Kim back at the gas station, he leaves with the rest of the group to go to the scrapyard. He has a change of heart and wants to apologize to Kim, so he goes looking for her in a nearby cornfield for some reason, where he finds her car abandoned. Ghostface shows up and bashes his knee in with the same tire iron he used to bash the southern guy's arm in and he runs away as fast as he can to hide in Beth's car. He locks it and sees Ghostface in the rearview mirror. Ghostface is seen holding a large corn plant and lights it on fire, which he then uses to light the trail of gasoline going straight to Kim's car on fire. The whole car goes ablaze, fills up with smoke, and he dies off screen, presumably from a fatal asthma attack. This is honestly a really sad kill that gets even more sad when you hear Kim's reaction. You know, I honestly can't fault the cast for this season's problems, because they actually gave mostly solid performances throughout, and I actually like the friendship between Kim and Manny. It felt very real. Now, obviously, this kill was done by Beth. She admits it during her reveal, and it just also makes the most sense. Beth's goal is to destroy the friend group and tear them away from each other, so her killing Manny was purely meant to break Kim's heart and make her regret fighting with him. Plus, she's really the only one who would have had a lighter since she smoked cigarettes. Plus, she was already with the group. Yada, yada, yada. We got it by now. Great kill, but also a very mean-spirited one, too. Amir, played by Biggie's son CJ Wallace, is Beth's frenemy turned love interest at probably the worst time possible. Amir meets probably the most brutal death of the season too, which hurts more when you find out who killed him. Amir goes to Beth's house to visit her, where they start becoming closer, and Beth tells him that he shouldn't get close to her because friends are expendable and he might get hurt. Despite all this, they end up having sex, and Ghostface texts the group afterwards, making them choose who should die next. Amir texts Dion's name because they said he should, but clearly Ghostface is a bad listener because he breaks into Beth's house and begins chasing after her and Amir. They split up, and Amir finds a morgue because Beth lives in a funeral home where he hides. Ghostface comes in and begins checking the fridge where the bodies are kept, stabbing them to make sure. He eventually opens Amir's door, and Amir kicks him down and runs out of the room to a nearby elevator. We know where this is going when Ghostface picks up a bone saw, and he finds Amir in the elevator, taking the stairs so he can catch up to him. Unfortunately, just when Amir thinks he's finally gotten away, Ghostface impales Amir with the bone saw through the elevator door, and when the elevator starts going down, the bone saw slices right down his midsection. He stumbles out and falls to the floor but before Ghostface enters the room and stands above him, who allows Amir to take off his mask. It's... it's... oh, he died before we could find out. Nice. Luckily, I know who it is, and you should too, because it's really obvious. It was Beth, duh. Hence the surprised look on his face, and because it's pretty predictable up at this point. We know it was Beth for reasons she low-key foreshadowed before his death, telling him that he should stay away from him if he doesn't want to die or get hurt. It's also a really sad death, since Amir was probably most people's favorite character, including mine, and it's also without a doubt the most brutal death of this season. Why do horror movies always give the most beloved characters the most brutal deaths? Assholes. Second to last, we have Jay Elliott, who is Dion's half-brother and is played by Tyga, you know, the rapper. After the party on the rooftop, Jay is cleaning up when he receives a call from Ghostface, who tells him that the jig is up and he isn't needed anymore since he's taking all the credit for everything. Jay acts oblivious and continues cleaning, and when he looks behind him, he's greeted by Ghostface, who stabs him multiple times with a trash picker. He finally dies after he's saved from the trailer by Dion, but not before getting his big reveal and monologue in. Jay says the reason he's doing this is because Dion never treated him like a brother, and he took credit for everything in Marcus's life simply because he wanted the fame that Marcus had and he was keeping up with a stupid lie. He teases who his accomplice was and that's where he dies. Man, if only that trash picker had picked up his music instead. Also, no, that's not hate personally towards Tyga. I think he's a cool guy and a solid actor for the most part, especially in this role. And he does have musical talent, he just doesn't execute it very well. This kill was obviously done by Beth because it realistically had to have been her, and no, there isn't some surprise third killer like the first two seasons. This season doesn't have that deep of a lore. 
Beth, who also doesn't have a last name for some reason, although the internet lists her name as Thompson, but I don't think that's her last name canonically, is our second to last kill who we can confirm has an official killer. Beth reveals herself when Liv bashes her in the head with a flagpole in the library after saying some suspicious things that tie her to Amir's death. And when she wakes up, Dion is there and is unable to figure out who is telling the truth. Dion begins to call the cops, but gets shot, which goes right through his phone and into his ribs. Dion, looking up in shock, looks at Liv, who is not holding the gun, when they both look at Beth, who is holding the gun and confirms herself as the second and final killer of Scream Resurrection. This was unfortunately a very underwhelming reveal. While I actually didn't expect her very much, her reveal was very bland and anticlimactic, which is disappointing because I actually think Beth is a great killer and character in general. Georgia Wickham plays the moody, unfazed goth teenager very well, and she does a good job at acting completely emotionless and nuts after her reveal. Anyway, she chases Liv through the school while Deanna's knocked out and actually lands a stab in her leg. They get to the gymnasium, where Beth begins monologuing and explaining herself, and a drop of blood from Liv's leg that lands onto her head helps her locate Liv on a ladder, which they then use to go up onto the roof. After some more monologuing and taking my job, Dion appears and bashes her head with a football helmet, and Liv does the same, which knocks Beth through the skylight and back into the gym. When she comes back for one last scare, Kim comes in and finishes her off by shooting her multiple times. This kill was done by Kim. Nah, I'm kidding. We still got two more kills we actually need to create theories on. Latavius, a resident of College Park played by DC Youngfly, is one of Jay's friends and is pretty much a nothing character, hence why he probably gets the most non-brutal kill of the series. Kim is walking home when she's greeted by Latavius, who tries to riz her up unsuccessfully. Kim eventually goes back to her house and is watching Rob Zombie's Halloween. When she gets a call from Ghostface, who tells her he isn't there to scare her, he's there to kill her, she runs open to find Latavius dead on the couch, his throat slit wide open. I think both Kim's phone call and Latavius' death were done by Jay, mainly because Beth was probably either with Amir or at school, although I can't exactly figure out why Jay killed him. He didn't really do anything wrong, because he's kind of a nothing burger. Did he just want to get a kill in for fun? I don't know, but either way, he did. Last but not least, we have Officer B. Westbrook. Officer B. Westbrook, played by Big Boy, is a police officer who was investigating the attack of Liv's dad. He's walking down the hallway when he sees a nurse pushing a cart full of medicine into a nearby room, and he offers to take it for her. She agrees, and he takes it with him into a nearby surgery room, where he starts downing a bottle of pills. Ghostface is a proud member of Hashtag Just Say No, so he comes out from behind a curtain and stabs him straight through the head. God damn. It's not often we see head stabbings and scream, and this one is especially brutal. To make sure he's really dead, Ghostface douses him with a bottle of lighter fluid and lights him on fire while admiring his work. Oh yeah, and he pulls it out in a really fucking brutal way too. Damn. I think this kill was definitely done by Beth, mainly because Beth is really the only one who shows proficiency in fire kills, since she always has a cigarette lighter on her. She admitted to ending Manny in a fiery rage, so it just makes the most sense to me. But hey, whether it was Beth or Jay, Scream Resurrection gave us a total of 11 kills this time around, which is the same amount as Scream 4 if you don't count the fake out stab deaths. Personally, my favorite kill in Scream Resurrection is Manny. A lot of good kills here, but Manny's gets points for being a huge fire stun and for being especially dark and mean spirited. My least favorite kill would probably go to Dion, since it's relatively tame, but I definitely have to give this show credit for killing an actual child. Not many horror movies and shows have the guts to do that. There you go, my Who Killed Who for Scream Resurrection. I hope I did a good job at giving you all what you wanted, and let me know who you think killed who in Scream Resurrection. I actually have a bonus video coming out on Sunday, and on Friday, I'll be doing a Who Killed Who for the original Scream. Until then, my name is Zero. You're watching The Flash.